So I'm really, really, it's a great pleasure actually to introduce Hot Shot Hot Wires. Come on in, come on in, Let's take a picture. Oh. Come on everybody, give them a round of applause. This is our next generation of scientists and actually will get us to Mars. You'll be on Mars. <laughs> so with that said, they're actually going to give us a really fascinating talk about how to develop mega power electricity that will take us to Mars. So take it away, guys. <laughs> We are a team of first Lego League students and we will present a method for generating electricity on our future Mars colonies. First is for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. It is a non-profit organization started by famous inventor Dean Kamen to spark young people's minds in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. First Lego League, or FLO, is one of the four main programs of FIRST for kids ages 9 through 14. First Lego League, or FLO, is one of the four main programs. First Lego League is composed of four different parts. These parts are the research project, the core values, the robot design, and the robot game. The research project is focused on solving a real world problem as a team using science and engineering. Last year, the theme of the program was into orbit and the students were expected to solve a problem related to human space travel. Now we will present our research project that we worked on during the Inter-Orbit FLL season. The human desire to explore uncharted frontiers has led us to think about establishing outposts on Mars. Um, our team explored several topics related to human space travel, such as oxygen, water, trash, recreation, and the effects of microgravity on living organisms. We found human Mars exploration most exciting. After researching many sources and talking to experts, we realized that some of the biggest long-term problems in this area are providing food, oxygen, water, radiation shielding, and energy to the, sh to the settlers. We evaluated these problems and decided to work on a system that could generate electricity to power a Mars colony. From our research, we learned that a small uranium-based nuclear reactor called Kilopower is likely to be used by the first humans on Mars. However, all proposed long-term solutions have major drawbacks, and there was no agreement among scientists on a definite energy source for a permanent Mars settlement. We wanted to create a solution that would help with all aspects of life on Mars. Electricity is a critical requirement for sustaining a permanent residence on Mars because it is needed for heating, for the human's daily needs, for exploration, for extracting resources like oxygen and water, and for growing food. NASA's near-term solution, Kilopower, can supply tens of kilowatts of electrical power for the first Mars explorers. However, using nuclear energy to generate hundreds or thousands of kilowatts for the next phase of Mars exploration has several problems. These include a possible accident during takeoff, radiation risk to astronauts, and that the reactors cannot be scaled or repaired. Geothermal energy is being seriously considered by many scientists. In 2016, Forbes magazine published an article titled, Why Geothermal Energy Will Be Key to Mars Colonization. However, in most places on Mars, this will require drilling several kilometers deep, which is on an average, temperature increases slowly with depth on Mars. This makes geothermal energy expensive and complex. Solar energy is viable, but would be unreliable due to weak insulation and dust. Martian air is too thin, and the wind has very little energy, even at storm speeds. Our solution, Megapower, solves the problem of powering a permanent human outpost on Mars in a completely new way and overcomes the drawbacks of other people's solutions. Megapower generates energy from the resource abundant on Mars. Mars has the tallest mountains and the deepest canyons and craters in the solar system. We can convert the gravitational 
educational potential energy from these features into usable energy. In the megapower system, Megalith excavated at higher elevations descends on a cable car like system to convert potential energy into kinetic energy. This can be used to run electric generators. Dr. Vivian Gornich, an expert in molecular radiology at NASA, told us that crater walls would be more suitable for megapower than mountains. Crater walls are steeper than mountain sides and have large amounts of easy to excavate regolith near the rims. Excavators at the rim of the crater will continuously dig and deposit regolith in a chute. This chute will have a sensor activated opening to fill containers connected to a cable car like system as they pass by. The filled containers will descend due to their weight and will release the regolith at the bottom of the crater. The lighter, empty containers will be pulled back up as the cable moves continuously by the weight of the containers being filled at the top. The motion of the cable going around wheels will power generators to produce the energy. We came up with the idea for mega power by evaluating different energy sources on it. We eliminated fossil fuels, solar, wind, and geothermal energy. Surprisingly, hydropower led to an efficient way of generating power on Mars using potential energy. We used inspiration from Sirius to come up with the final solution to yield the steady power from Mars. We did several calculations to check the feasibility of the energy. <coughs> using the gravitational potential energy formula, potential energy equals mass times acceleration due to gravity times height, we found that a 1 kilogram mass at a height of 1 meter has a potential energy of about 3.8 joules on Mars. Accounting for losses due to friction, conversion, and excavation, we assumed that roughly half, or about 2 joules of electrical energy can be extracted. Projecting this to a system in which 1 cubic meter containers descend along 5 kilometers, about 12 million joules of electrical energy can be um, extracted from each container. This calculation uses the commonly accepted density of about 1.2 grams per cubic centimeter for Mars regolith. At a reasonable angle of 45 degrees and speed of 14 kilometers per hour, just 60 containers can generate 200 kilowatts. This is because the system would complete one full cycle every hour and one container would arrive every minute. That is 12 million joules in 60 seconds, which is 200 kilowatts. The power yield can easily be scaled to a megawatt by increasing the size and number of containers, or by using multiple cables. We also did calculations to check that enough electricity could be generated by excavating a reasonable amount of regolith. Since one cubic meter of regolith can generate two, 12 million joules, a 25 meter deep, one square kilometer, block of regolith with a volume of 25 million cubic meters can produce about 300 trillion joules. This is equivalent to about 83,000 megawatt hours, or almost 10 megawatt years, which means that this reasonable amount of regolith can provide one megawatt continuously for 10 years. based on existing technologies. Cable transportation systems are used in the mining industry and can span over 50 kilometers. Conversion between potential and electrical energy has been commercially developed by a company called Energy Walls. Their 90% efficiency is much higher than our conservative estimate of 50%. Since excavation for ice and other resources will be a big part of a Mars settlement, NASA has been developing efficient robotic excavators. One design, called the Regolith Advanced Surface Systems Operations <coughs> Robot, or RAZER, is most suited for our solution. The light and versatile RAZER can quickly dig up and transport about twice its mass in the Regolith. RAZERs are powered by onboard rechargeable batteries. We communicated with engineers working on robotics excavators in NASA's Kennedy Space Center's Swampworks team. They had suggested that another excavator design, the Lance and the Chariot, would also be suitable for megapower. In our proposed design, a generator at the top would supply power to inductive charging pads for the excavators. 
The bulk of the electricity will be generated near the bottom to power the habitat and its support systems. The discarded regolith would be spread over the habitation modules to provide radiation shielding. Megapower's main components are supports, cables, e containers, excavators, and two generators. These will be launched to Mars on a single spacecraft in advance of the crew. The equipment will be dropped using at least two landers. The main generator would land at the bottom of the crater or canyon where it will produce the bulk of electricity for the human outpost. All other components would land at the top. The supports and cables will be lowered by gravity as needed and would be installed robotically using kilopowers energy. The supports would be in the shape of concentric telescoping cylinders, like an antenna. They will be closed while being transported to Mars and will reopen by using spring action. Most of Mega Power's cost will come from transporting its parts to Mars, so everything needs to be lightweight. Since Mars has only 38% of its gravity, the cables and supports have to be only 38% as strong as on Earth. For added reliability, we can build two systems close to each other. One can be used to transport a repair crew if the other breaks down. If a razor needs repairs, it can be transported down on the system to the base. Experts at Doppelmayr, world's largest cable transportation company, confirmed the feasibility of our 200 kilowatt system after doing some engineering calculations. They calculated that a 32 millimeter thick steel cable would be sufficient, but suggested using Kevlar, which is stronger and lighter than steel. Kevlar has already been tested on Mars, as well as in a cable transportation system in New Mexico. We also propose using carbon fiber for our supports and containers. The highest grade carbon fiber can be 10 times stronger and five times lighter than steel. This will all help conserve weight and space. spoke with several engineers and scientists and two renewable energy companies. Dr. Vivian Gornitz, a NASA geologist, suggests that we implement our solution on crater walls. Rachel Cox and Jason Schuller, engineers in NASA Swamp Works, share the technical details of excavators that can be used on Mars, such as Razor. We got useful information from engineers at Dalkmeyer, the world's largest cable transportation company. Their calculations showed that a 200 kilowatt system can be implemented with reasonable cables and supports, even if traditional materials such as steel is used. 
Dr. Michael Hecht, a principal investigator for the Mars 2020 mission, thought that our idea was very intriguing and it could also work on the moon. He shared it to Dr. Jerry Sanders, the head of the ISRU program at NASA, who was also very impressed. After hearing about our idea, Dr. Robert Zubin, the president of the Mars Society, spoke to us on Skype. He encouraged us to submit our work for a presentation at the 22nd Annual Mars Society Convention. We are very grateful for this opportunity. Lastly, we have built a proof of concept to show how our solution works. First, the red lip will start at the top and be excavated and dropped into carbon fiber buckets or containers. The red lip will then descend, descend down the system and start its potential energy and turn into kinetic energy as the red lip descends. This will generate electricity from the habit down below. In our system, the light bulb lights up when the red lip descends. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. We now be happy to take any questions. Given a kind of a standard size crater of about two or three kilometers in diameter with the right slope, um, if you could find one, uh, I'm, and I'm sure you can, uh, how long would you be able to kind of recover power from that? So we plan to put our system in the middle of the crater so mm -hmm. that we have enough um, like, we have enough materials at the top to excavate them. Um, so it'll probably take a while before, like, we run out of crater. Sure. And then also, um, we found during our research that um, the crater walls tend to be, like, up to seven kilometers, um, and not, like, just two Okay, so it's a long time, several yeah. years. <laughs> so, thinking about the efficiency of energy recovery, I mean, I can see it's it's a brilliant system, really, to you know to get that regolith down off the mountain top and use it for the insulation and shielding. But, but in the meantime, you're generating electricity, you know, running that dynamo, and yet you have to actually take some electricity and use it for the motor to get the cable back up to the top. Or, or does it just run on gravity? Is it just gravity yeah, carrying it's it down the mountains? Yeah, I see. So, so you don't you don't actually have to run any motors to keep the system going at all. At the beginning, it will take some energy to get it started, but after like a little to get it started, then it will run purely on gravity. Just runs downhill. So wonderfully original idea. I really like it. Um, why do you think this isn't done more frequently here on Earth? It's less like the, the mountains are less tall, so it's not as. And also, uh, excavating all of the mountainous regions can severely affect the wildlife, the wildlife on Earth, and all of the forests and. Because we pretty much have to like blow up yeah. all of everything that's living there before we can actually use it. Yeah. So yeah, it's not very easy. Do you guys have any idea how much energy it'll take to get the regolith onto the the conveyor? Yeah. How, how much energy did you account for in the excavation process? And a third part of that, if I could add on, is it's also going to take energy to move the regolith away from the bottom of your conveyor. So if when you quoted a 50% efficiency, did you take all of this into account, or was that just the machine itself? It, it was like, uh, yeah, we took it all into account to get a conservative estimate of 50%. And also, to also answer your question, the, um, our system would be in the middle of the crater, so we leave space for the bottom of the, we leave space for the fragment to go to the bottom and fill up. Mm -hmm. And also at the top, we leave space for it to be excavated. Right, but as, as your space on top, the 25 
kilometer, cubic kilometer becomes, you know, you, when you have to excavate farther and farther from your um, conveyor, that starts requiring more and more energy. Or if you excavate deeper and have to bring that up to your um, uh, a, a, a conveyor, that also consumes more energy. So you have to keep that in mind as well. So, so there's a limit to how efficient you can be when you're far from your conveyor. Yeah, that's true. But um, when we um, chose craters, one of the main things we accounted for is that at the top of the asteroid hits, it like releases, it has like a big impact. So a lot of the um, regolith at the top of the crater is like loose and easy to excavate. And then while we did like perform the actual calculations about efficiency and like how much we um, need to use in um, excavation, we use like current um, like companies that have that do this commercially and they have a 90% um, conversion efficiency. So we figured that a 15% was reasonable. Can I answer part of that question about the excavation at the top? Sure. So uh, the excavators will also excavate sort of on a slope. Mm -hmm. So it's like your Tesla when it goes downhill, it charges itself. Uh, so when the excavator full of regolith is coming after excavating and depositing to the chute, it will generate more electricity than it will be needed, than it will need to go back up because going back up empty. So the same concept. Uh, in a different form. Uh, so so we will we'll need very little energy at the top mm -hmm. for excavation. Mm -hmm. and what type of material is this side of the regolith again being hoisted up? Um, they're metals, um, water, and building materials inside the I just wanted to commend you guys. You guys are younger than most of us in the room. And you're <laughs>